I was born and raised in Co-op City in the Bronx, and it was, you know, huge buildings, skyscrapers, um, similar to what they call projects, but it was a Mitchell Lama development. And, you know, I just remember growing up in the time where, you know, you walked around, it was pretty safe. So um, that's, that's basically it. You th I mean, what, what do you think it was about growing up there during that time period that fed your ambitions? So my, my ambitions were fed strictly on just watching too much <laughs> science fiction. You know, I watched Star Trek Space 99 and all those things. And I, I just, I don't want to say I was obsessed, but it put into my head that I wanted to be an astronaut and explore uh, the unknown. So that's about seven years old. I just started on that journey of doing that. Um, you know, a lot of people ask me, hey, how did you know what to do? And, and I said, I didn't. I kind of gleaned from the show in Star Trek these basic ideas like, hey, if you're going to fly a spaceship, a starship, excuse me, if you're going to do that, you're going to go to the Starfleet Academy. Okay, so that's um, college level material, right? So, okay, so you're going to go to some academy. So uh, most of them are good in math and science. Okay, I don't know about math and science, but I'm going to be good in it. Uh, I wanted to fly because I wanted to fly the enterprise. So I'm going to become a pilot. So it was just those, those basic things that fed into that. And that's what that show taught me. Um, and plus, you see the Enterprise. I mean, Gene Roddenberry did a great job of showing how diversity on a ship to explore for five years and how they can get through basically anything. Did anybody ever tell you you couldn't? I think people thought it was a phase that I would grow out of. Um, at, in the 70s, you know, it was um, very, to me, very traditional roles that were impressed upon you yeah. not particularly said so yeah. as a kid yeah as a kid growing up I was the one that played sports the one that hang out hung out with the boys called the tomboy a lot because I was just not norm it got made fun of a lot so you know being an astronaut was one of those things that not a lot of women did during that time at least they didn't speak about it so but again I was like my own person I was my own person by third grade so it wasn't, people didn't say I couldn't do it, but people thought I would grow out of it and it just kept going. So, and now they're like, oh, we're so proud of you. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, what did your mom think? Did you bring you, these ideas home with you? Oh yeah, she knew that. I mean, I, again, my, my mom was, uh, she was a single parent. So she was basically working, um, you know, about seven or eight, my, my dad left. So my mom was too busy trying to s keep us sustained in the apartment and working. She worked nights. So I stayed, I stayed quite a bit with my grandmother or sometimes with my aunt. And, uh, okay. you know, she knew that I was interested when I started reading, I had someone who would another mentor or another educator who had a whole bunch of Star Trek books. So she would feed my, my, obsession uh, I don't want to say obsession because that sounds like too too crazy but she would she would feed the fact that I, I like Star Trek by giving me Star Trek books so you know I read a lot I mean there was a point where I was probably reading a book a day and just breezing through them just to absorb more hmm. and you just sort of naturally fell into a, a science and technology kind of tractor beam if you will yeah so I mean you have to right because if you want to do space and you want to do this stuff, mathematics is key. So it was, I had to be good in math and science. Um, it wasn't the fact that I know I was. No, I'm just going to work hard enough to be good at it. So uh, I, I would say, I think in sixth grade, I ended up starting honors classes because in, in, the, in the Bronx, they had this honors track. Mm -hmm. And I just stayed in honors classes all the way up through college. So uh, by the time I was in 12th grade, I was doing calculus. Um, and this, these things don't look, I'm not like some genius in math. I mean, it just takes work. 
and math is a lot of repetition and a lot of problems and seeing a lot of problems and actually asking the why to it. And even in science, it's the same thing. So I just naturally gravitated to those things. And when I was 15, I was given the opportunity to, I got picked up for a program called STEP. At the time it was science technology entry program at University of Binghamton. So it was, it was, this program was in a book of all other types of STEM programs. And my mom said, you're gonna to go to one of these because she knew I was into math and science. And I found that applied and got picked up. So I, I did a summer, summer doing research in like biochemistry, biology, physics, all these things. And it was designed for economically disadvantaged kids. So you had kids that were Hispanic, kids that were Asian, uh, kids of color, like it was, it wasn't about, it was more financially based than ethnicity based, I would say. So you had a bunch of kids that, you know, economically underserved that were going to this program. And I was one of those kids. And there was a lot of smart kids and I did well enough for the following year, they invited me back to the program to do one-on-one -on -one research with a professor. So I, I worked with a professor, I think 16, that was 16 or 17, my junior year, uh, with a professor in the, in the electrical engineering field. Hmm. And how old were you when you, when you uh, went into the military? I went into the military after I graduated from college in electrical engineering. Um, I was 20, 22, 23 at the time. 20, I think 2023. Okay. And you just went in, you just enlisted? No, uh, I was actually looking for a pilot slot. So once I completed college, one thing I knew is that to become a pilot in the military, you have to be an officer. To be an officer, you have to have a four-year degree. Unless you're going warrant officer program in the army, you need a two-year degree. So in my senior year of high school, you know, I was applying to universities uh, to either get a degree in some type of engineering, whether it was gonna be, I was torn between aeronautical and aerospace and electrical engineering would be my fallback because I had done research in that. So I was familiar with that science. So I ended up going to the University of New Haven in electrical engineering. And once I graduated, I started talking to recruiters to see if there were pilot slots available. What I didn't understand at the time is that there's a difference between enlisted recruiters and officer recruiters, in particular for the Navy and I believe in the Air Force. So when I was speaking to recruiters in New York, they were saying there were no pilot slots available. Because of that, I decided to check into the Army and the Warrant Officer Program, and they said they had helicopter spots. And so I took the ASVAB, did very well, which I think is natural, just graduating from college. And I was actually going to sign up for the, uh, the Army. And then a guy I was dating reached out to a recruiter in San Diego and said, hey, he said, give me a call. And I called him up and he said, you have a four-year degree, you have an engineering degree. If you come out here, take the test for the Navy and do well, we'll get you a pilot slot. And I said, bet. So I took a five-day bus trip out to San Diego hung out with my boyfriend for a while who was stationed at uh, Marine Corps Air Base Yuma. Went to take the test, passed the test, did all the paperwork, and um, it was a waiting game at that point. Uh, so a couple of months later, I found out I got accepted into Officer Candidate School for the Navy, for Navy pilot training, and that's what I wanted to begin with. So just a little persistence and a little help goes a long way. Well, I did have mentors. I mean, I've had mentors since junior high school um, from one person, you know, one lady who, who was an educator herself in my after school program who gave me Star Trek books. I had a teacher in science who um, let, you know, who I worked for just because, you know, I was around science um, and he was, you know, he was, he was a, a teacher in my junior high school. In high school, I had mentors because my high school was a little unique. I worked in the planetarium squad and I had, uh, 
you know, which is planetarium talks about space, so astronomy. So I had access to that and people who were looking out for me. In college, my first year, I befriended uh, my physics professor who I started doing work study for. And he eventually uh, made me apply to a program in my junior year at the University of Maine in Orono for electrical engineering research. Um, because he knew I, I, you know, I, I could do research and he was, I didn't want to do it because I wanted to hang out my summer. He's like, no, you're going to apply. So he, he basically forced my hand and I got picked up and did research for the summer at the University of Maine in Orono. Um, yes, so I've had a lot of people who kind of uh, fed into my need or pushed me to just be that, just to keep me on that direction. So uh, I appreciate all of their help. And I, I pay that back, so. Hmm. Okay. So I got to ask, I mean, YouTube planes, they fly at like 70,000 feet altitude. That's yes. And I know this, the Felix Baumgartner guy, he jumped out of a something that was only like, that was half as high. And I, I, I mean, emotionally, when you're flying that high, when you're flying 70,000 feet, that must be scary. I mean, how do you manage the emotions? When you're up that I, I wouldn't say, yeah, I wouldn't say it's scary. Um, this is, uh, this is something that I've dreamed, dreamed about all my life. So it's, I'm not fearful of the fact that I'm in a pressure suit and I'm flying in a plane. You know, remember the U2 is my, um, at this point, this is my fifth or sixth plane that I'm flying in the military. Um, above 70,000 feet, there's a lot of physiological differences at that, out, at that, at that altitude. So uh, number one, we wear the pressure suit for two reasons, to supply oxygen, 100% oxygen to us and to keep our bodies alive if the cockpit depressurizes. Um, above Armstrong's line, which is about 63,000 feet, there's not enough pressure in the atmosphere to keep like the blood within your body. So um, it's, so we basically say your blood boils. So uh, exposure to that will, will kill you in a matter of seconds. But it, that doesn't scare me because I have great people who um, keep the suit, you know, that are responsible for keeping the pressure suit and keeping me alive. That's, that's a great thing. Um, and as a pilot, it's like living my, you know, living my dream. So yeah, there's no fear in that. Uh, okay, the I fear is not being able to do that or not being able to. Look, a, a lot of people are like, wow, it's dangerous. Could you die? Absolutely. The fear, the fear of death is a reality if you don't do things right or things go wrong. But I'd rather die doing something that I love than just sitting on the couch. I mean, I, I'll be, just be real. I, I would die trying to pursue my dreams than sitting there being fearful and not taking the first step. So it sounds like you were just focused from the time you started reading those, those books that the people around you were giving you all the way until you got on the plane. Right. I mean, I'm just focused on that and, and everything I did at, at the age of seven that I knew was going to um, add to the fact that I was going to be an astronaut and astronauts are very diverse individuals, right? So you think about it on the enterprise, Kirk had all these skill sets that he developed over time that helped him conquer any situation. As astronauts, you're going into the unknown. So you need to draw upon your skill sets to help you navigate that. As a kid, I knew everything that I did was for the purpose of being one day an astronaut, and that's developing this diverse skill set. So if there's something new to me, I look at it as an, a challenge and an opportunity to learn something new about myself and about, um, about the environment. So maybe one day that particular experience will help me navigate through something else unknown. Make sense? Yeah. And it sounds like you basically saw yourself in that position years before you actually got there. So when you were in that, when you finally got there, it felt completely natural to you. Absolutely. Yes. So, I mean, some people, 
some people's vision is some people's vision it's very i don't want to say short-sighted but some people there's so much stuff going on in their life that, that they cannot see maybe what the future may hold or they can't see they can't act in a way to put themselves where they want to be right so I believe I put myself where I wanted to be. I said, hey, I want to be an astronaut. How am I going to get there? Let's hit these wickets. And yes, when I think when you have that drive and you have that determination, it's recognized by other people. And other people, if they're in a position, they may try to help you. So um, I've always seen myself, as I think back on it, you know, 43 years ago, I said, this is where I want to be. I'm going to put myself there. And that's, and that's where the work began for me. Yeah. But that's not every seven year old. No. So was it, you just were in touch with your dream at that age or. I was some people are not, some people find it later on. Um, I will tell you, I, I one of my, I have some fans, but one of my biggest fans is a five-year-old girl. She might be five or six now um, that I met last year through her mom who wants to be a pilot, period. She knows that. Um, you would even say she's probably hyper-focused on what she wants to do. And anything she does, she is just focused and crushes it. There are some kids out there that know what they want and their parents are helping them go through that. Um, there are some kids that don't know, and I see those kids too, and they might be a little older and they say, like, I, I may want to fly, but I'm not sure. And I said, and I tell them, if you have a little bit of a fire about something, then pursue it. Pursue that because maybe along that, because you're starting to walk on a journey, and then eventually you might see something on that journey that fires you up more. And then go in that direction. And then eventually you'll be like, oh man, I'm in this cool spot where I get to do all these things that I wanted to do. Um, you have to, I mean, you have to start walking on that to, to actually see what unfolds. So um, that's, that's what I tell people. Some people see it as clear as day. Other people, it's, it's like a big fog, but there's these points of light that they can walk towards so do that so what's what's looking back on your career what surprised you the most what was the one thing that was most unexpected <laughs> that you can talk them, about yeah i mean in terms of mission sets um, in terms of your not, career trajectory, just anything really. Yeah, the, the, the only thing that surprised me the most is that I had kids. Okay. Yeah, that's, I mean, to be real, kids were not in the equation for me. Um, hmm. So, because I knew that I was focused on what I needed to do. And, you know, when I got married, my husband, you know, wanted to have kids, but he was okay not having kids. But there's just a point when you're like, um, you know, in a relationship, there's give and take. So, uh, you know, I said to him, all right, let's, uh, he wanted two and I wanted zero. So I said, okay, I'll tempt one. And then, uh, yeah, we did, we did that. So, I mean, it's, that is a decision that I, I will never regret making because I mean, my son is amazing. And then further on down the line, you know, six years later, we adopted another child. So um, this was something we had talked about. I didn't think it was going to happen because of the focus that I had on my career. But, you know, sometimes you got to stop and, all right, well, take a detour. Hmm. Yeah. So can you remember times when you, you had to struggle through something? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and how did you do that? How did you overcome? So a lot of my struggles came 
and I, I talked about this. Um, I just recently came back from Seattle uh, with, uh, you know, with some women at the Flight Museum in Seattle, uh, the Boeing Flight Museum of Flight. And we, I talked about that in, this, in the 90s when I went into flight school, there was a huge push by the Navy to have minorities and women in aviation field because there was not a lot of us, especially pilots. And I was talking about when you get to a place like that where there is a recruitment or there's this equal opportunity or something, there is this cloud that is over your head that you, and it's, it could be perception, it could be real. When you walk in a room, people think you're there, not because you're an engineer, not because you did well in the test, not because you're an amazing person, you got all these skills, they look at you, oh, you're just a push for diversity, oh, you're a push for a quota, or you're a push for diversity, equity, inclusion is the buzzword that we use now. And that puts a lot of pressure on the people who are there, who, deserve to be there because of their accomplishments, but still have this over their head. It's a, it's a double-edged sword. And it's, that is sometimes hard to overcome because people who are currently there may see you in a different light and see that you're there because of whatever reason. And it took my first on-wing who I flew with in the, the Navy, on wing is a person that you fly with to your first solo. Um, he was extremely tough on me in the aircraft. And when I mean tough, you know, now people get really hurt feelings when people talk harsh to you or may say, uh, you know, may say bad words to you. Um, I'm not sure what the audience is. My on wing, um, he would curse me out in the aircraft on a daily basis. And he would yell at me and I can't get anywhere. Like I'm sitting in an aircraft and we're flying, you know, 6,000 feet above the ground. There's nowhere to go. And I had to take his instruction and look, he, he's a sailor. I'm a sailor. You know, this is, you know, we're talking about pretty explicit language, but I mean, he was a great instructor, but he was very hard. And that caused a lot of pressure on me in, in a lot of forms, in a lot of ways. And it manifested in a lot of ways. But at the end of flying, when it was time for me to select, and I had this doubt, like, you know, when, you know, people see me, you know, they're going to think, you know, they're going to think I'm just here for diversity reasons. And he said to me, you know, when you walk in a room, people are going to think a lot of things. They're going to think you're here because of X, Y, and Z. And he said, what you're going to have to do is just perform and perform at the top, the top is the highest level all the time. And he says, eventually, when you come in a room, the only thing they're going to say is you're that damn good. That's why you're here. So the takeaway from that is just it's about performance. It's about, you know, unfortunately, women and people of color may still have to go through that. But there is, there is a cutoff and there's a reason and you're there because you've made it because you deserve it. I don't care what other people say. If you're performing at that level, let them talk behind your back. They're behind your back. You're facing forward doing your thing. So as much as you're gonna try not to sweat it, you're gonna sweat it a little bit, but just listen to my words. And if you keep doing that, you will perform. I mean, there's a point where even when I made Colonel in the Air Force, so I made 06. I had friends that I had known for years that never congratulated me on making it because they thought I made it for whatever reason. And it's like, in my head, at this point now, I'm over 20 years in. And in my mind, I didn't care. I just brushed that aside, right? As Jay-Z says, dirt, you know, brush it off your shoulders. Because I'm like, look, I said, I've flown six different aircraft. I have, I have checked all the boxes. I did a staff tour. I did a command tour. I have ranked in the top three throughout my career. Yeah, I deserve to be, I deserve to be a Colonel. 
just because you didn't do what I did doesn't mean, number one, I'm better than you. On paper, on record, I'm better than you. If you don't want to say congratulations, that's your fault. I'm going to keep moving as you stay at your same rank. I, and it's not, it was one of those things that I was a little surprised at, but, uh, you know, just a little bit. I just kept moving. Well, and you also had mentors throughout your military career, too. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's a point, even as even as a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, some of my mentors were still Navy officers that I had met early on. And, you know, they helped me navigate some, you know, challenging times, especially when I came head to head. Um, in my Navy times, um, during my Navy service with people. And don't get me wrong, I wasn't this, um, you know, angel of sorts. I mean, I'm from the Bronx and I'm still with that Bronx attitude and I'm still that person. And I ref I don't wanna say I refuse to, to not change, but I just, I had to be myself and I had to be who I was. So I was that person that didn't take crap. And sometimes I came head to head with people that were my rank or higher and that caused some issues. Um, but I was able to navigate that with the help of some other people. And I learned as I got older to be able to just be more astute when it came to those political matters, help people behind me that felt the same way. And um, it didn't matter, like at this point as a Colonel to me, if you come to me for help, I don't care who you are, if you're talented and you're and you perform, I'll, I'll help you. And even if you're not performing, I'll tell you you're not performing and you need to do better, right? So um, I'm that equal opportunist mentor because I was mentored by a lot of people who were men, who were black, who were white, women who were white, who were black. I was mentored throughout culturally because these people saw something within me. So I do the same thing. And uh, so do you seek out mentees or do they come to you organically and naturally? Typically they come to me naturally, um, organically. So um, I still get mentored from time to time as well. Um, after my you military did. career, oh, absolutely. I, th I think you always look to, you have, I think my mentors now are more my peers. Okay. You always look to someone for that feedback. I, I think if you're not looking for that feedback, you're probably missing something. Um, you mean especially, like, how am I doing? Kind of feedback. Yeah. So uh, if I if there's a situation that comes across and you're talking to a friend, it's almost like I, I like direct feedback. If they say, "Oh, you you didn't handle that. Maybe you could have did it this way, or maybe you could have done it that way." I'm not saying this happens all the time, but once in a while, I do have some friends that I talk to. Um, especially now, when I'm retired, I've done a, a you know, a, a reality show. I'm on social media. I want to make sure that I always. I don't get caught up in the little things and I remain my authentic self. I remain who I am and I'm pretty good at that. Um, but sometimes, you know, I may say things or think some ways and I'm like, hey, is this, is this helpful for my audience or is this not? And I, and I get that feedback and I like that raw feedback, that honest feedback for me. But I do more of the mentoring now. And, you know, as you go through life, you still, you know, you still look for that feedback at least for me. You think there was one sort of one or two pivotal moments that really propelled you forward that you remember like notable moments, like, oh man, if that hadn't happened, I, it might've taken me a little longer to get here. I think one of the pivotal moments for me is when I, when I left, my fleet tour in the Navy uh, to go fly T6s as a T6 instructor. I had a mentor intervene because um, if, you, if you read my book, it's, it, it was a political situation that was going on and I felt like I was being put in a corner and not treated particularly fair. I was being set up 
it's a long story. It's a, it's, it's a long story. But he was able to get me orders to be an instructor at an Air Force base. And I think in that moment of doing that, the fact that I became an instructor for a new airframe, I was one of four Navy instructors in an Air Force base teaching Air Force and Navy students, which was huge. That is where I propelled to the U2 program and eventually switched over to the Air Force. Wow, really? So yes. as an instructor, at what, what was the type of plane, a, T, a T4? T6. A T6, T6 aircraft. Uh, but they're not yeah, he, they're not at all similar to you too so right they're not but the fact that i was in an air force base at the time i was about to leave the navy and my boss at the time said you should join the air force i think that was a pivotal moment for me and i would not have gotten that job if it wasn't for my mentor working it so if i was I was originally going to go back to flying helicopters as an instructor for the fleet replacement squadron. Mm -hmm. I was going to do that. But then when these orders came in, um, that got me out of that track, which I would have been great as a, an instructor, a Navy instructor for helicopters. But it got me out and got me into the Air Force realm and seeing how the Air Force worked. And then I switched over to the Air Force to fly U-2s. So that would not have happened if it was because of my mentor and friend who was looking out for me and knew the situation I was in, understood very well the situation I was in and made those moves for me. So I, yeah, I can't thank him enough for that. And, and we're still friends. You want to say his it, name? You want to acknowledge Yeah, him? in the book, I, I don't want to say his real name, but in my book, I call him Delgatti. Um, Yes, I call him that, but he uh, he did some uh, really awesome things because he he was also a person of color who was ahead of me, so he saw what was happening and he he knew he 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 knew the political environment. He was very politically astute, and he understood what was going on with me, and he was in my corner, and that's what I needed. So anything that my boss at my squadron was doing, it was. Um, a lot of it was, um, you know, just evened out by having someone having some in the position that he was at. Do you still fly? I fly, you know, just privately once in a while. Right now, I'm a personal trainer. I do motivational speaking. Uh, one of my clients owns a plane, so we go flying. He's uh, 70 years old, and I go fly with him. So he loves saying that. You know, he gets to boss me around and I go, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll bet he doesn't go very high up, though. He sure as hell doesn't go 70,000 feet. No, but he but he knows my background and he's he's been he's been my client for probably uh, three years. OK, now, are you too old to be an astronaut? Never too old to be an astronaut. I mean, there are people I mean, they just had. um Gosh, I forgot her name. It escapes me. Who was in her sixties? Go up and was it Blue Origin? One of the one of the oh. aircraft. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. So okay. never too ne <laughs> never too old. We'll see what happens. So that's still a dream of yours, then. Absolutely. Well, that that would be really cool. <laughs> wow. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. So, what advice would you give? Uh, a woman or a young girl who's in a situation that they don't want to be in and they want to pursue their, something that they're passionate about. I know you touched on this earlier. Right. So, you know, find someone who will be able to help you navigate that way. And if you can't, wow. I, it's almost so hard because we have Instagram and Facebook and all these social media platforms where you can reach out to people and touch people who are in positions that maybe you weren't normally necessarily be able to touch. So say if you wanted to be a designer and people were telling you you can't, I mean, there are men in jail who have, 
you know, done fashion shows with their, what they have at their disposal and have done some amazing things. So you have to be innovative on in how you want to get there. Um, if there's, if there's a woman being told or a girl that's being told, oh, you can't do that. First of all, I'm going to say that they're lying to you. You can't. Like sometimes you just need to hear that person say, you can't do it. So what do you think you need to do next? I can't answer that question, but try to get that done. If you're in a, if you're in a household where you're young and your parents are working, then talk to that grandparent, talk to that aunt, talk to that uncle to see if they can help you. Reach out to those people. And if you're old enough that you have a phone and, and you find that you're having a hard time, I'm, talk to me, maybe I could give you some ideas. Try to talk to other people to get ideas on how you can get your dreams or your desires going. Now, what can you, what can, I know you're restricted. You can't talk about any of your missions. I'm not going to ask you about any of your missions, but what can, right. what can you tell us about the, the plane itself, if anything? So, I mean, the U-2 is a high altitude intelligence surveillance reconnaissance ISR platform. We have multiple sensors that you can plug and play on there. On this, on there, you can do electrical optical, um, infrared, you can do Doppler. So it's like taking radar pictures, like weather pictures. You can actually take photograph pictures as if you had a Polaroid and you're just taking a picture on the ground. So what we do with those images, and we also have signals intelligence where we just listen in the atmosphere and we gather signals. That's all I can tell you. We take that information and we send it to what's called a distributed ground station. In that ground station, there's hundreds of people that work to um, disseminate the information, to analyze it and then disseminate it out to end users, which are people on the ground. If we're, if we have troops that are in contact, and this is, I'm talking about this from the perspective of back, you know, during uh, Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. Right. And we send that information back in near real time to the end user. So typically we can talk to those on the ground and we can go to different areas if requested that may be outside our mission set to assist them if possible. Um, there was one time I was ending a mission and I was immediately called for search and rescue because they had um, insurgents in Iraq had taken a soldier hostage. So they immediately called me on station, gave me, uh, vectored me to an area which I orbited to try to uh, one get imagery and, and obtain some signals to see if we can find this guy. So those are the things that we do. I mean, very top level. Was that successful? Did you find him? It was not. Um, he was, yeah, he was found uh, two days later. Wow. They found him. He was okay or not okay? No, not okay. Again, I don't know the audience. So, um, okay. no. Yeah. So, wow. no, he he passed away. Hmm. He was killed. He was killed in action. So I imagine there'd be a U2 over Ukraine right now or over Russia or something. I, I don't know, but I, I will tell you that the U2 has flown for, you know, this year, I think will be 67 years. And the U2 has been used in every type of hotspot that has happened. So I don't know, I'm not an expert. I, I have no idea, but I would, I would place money that it's being used in some capacity along with unmanned other unmanned aircraft uh satellites everything so so what's the what's the advantage of having a piloted u2 over a drone so no it's interesting so it's, it's always that question so how many people does it take to pilot a drone as opposed to sending one person up and and flying an aircraft so there's a couple of things if you have permissive airspace you have a person that's there that's eyes and ears that can talk and talk to people and see things real time and actually fly there. Uh, for a drone like the Global Hawk, um, 
during the time I was in the military, maybe there was a delay getting them there. The Global Hawk flew at a lower altitude than the U-2, so maybe not as much area coverage. Um, the Global Hawk is a great asset in a non-permissive environment, i.e. the enemy doesn't want you there. Um, so I think, you know, having a person in the aircraft is, is beneficial in certain situations. Having not a person in the aircraft is beneficial. So using both of those platforms together yield a very good outcome. Um, there are other drones at lower altitudes that can be used. And then of course you have your satellite imagery, but that's not as maneuverable, right? So right, right. Um, the U-2 has a long on-time station rate. So I think it's it's been great in what it has been able to do and what it has been able to capture. What is a long time on station rate? What does that mean? So the U-2 can, you know, for U-2 pilots, we go anywhere from nine to 12 hours or over 12 hour missions if we needed to. The Global Hawk can also stay long duration, um, but there are just some things that I think uh, at that time, I'm not sure if the, the new upgraded models are like this, but their imagery was a little different. I think they're getting better in their imagery. Our imagery has passed, has lasted the test of time, um, but I'm sure that is getting better because I've been out of the community for five years. So I'm oh, sure that, yeah, I'm sure that things are getting better. Yeah, so any aviation enthusiast who's yelling at me now at the screen, look, I've been out for five years. So how did the, how did Gary Powers get shot down? So you know you look at the movie Bridge of Spies. Gary Power got shot down, um, I believe, by SA two. Basically, Russia knew we were flying over. They were mad that they couldn't cat catch us. So what they did is just litter the sky with missiles and hit them. <laughs> like they got they're... lucky. <laughs> wow! Amazing. Yes. So I mean, was he at the maximum altitude? I mean, can they shoot planes down at 70,000 feet? So um, at that time, the U-2 was a little smaller. Okay. Um, the airframe is similar, but the wingspan was, I think, a little smaller. Um, I don't know how high he actually was. Um, so not sure, but they got him. So, so again, um, I understand if you can't answer this question, but when you're up there in you know, I don't know what you call it, on station is when you're in the midst of your mission. Can yes. you can you tell if somebody, if somebody knows you're up there? Like somebody who doesn't want you to be up there, can you tell? I would say they would, it depends on the system. They may or may not know that you're there. Okay, okay. I would say in the 1960s for Gary Powers, they knew he was there. Huh. So, yeah. But the equipment's gotten more sophisticated by, and since then, obviously. The U-2 airframe has been around for 67 years and has done really well. So, um, yes, so inside the U-2, the avionics is um, new and approved. Amazing, amazing. So, and you have to understand that the U-2 does not carry, we don't carry weapons. We have sensors and we have an electronic warfare system. Okay, so how do they prepare you if you end up getting shot down or if you have a problem flying and the crashes or something and you survive? Right, so we have, uh, before we go fly, we always get an intelligence brief prior. We know, this, we know the area we're gonna fly in, we know the situation. We know if there is an emergency, we have to land as what airfields we can land at, what we can't. We also know what happens in the case of we getting, of us, the aircraft going down in, this, in an area that is hostile. Um, we train for that prior to even getting into the aircraft. We do uh, what's called SEER or SERI school, depending on what branch of service you're in, which is so survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. Um, for reconnaissance pilots, we do other training to prepare us mentally and physically for if you know, the ish hits the fan. So um, we're highly trained about, we're highly trained 
and and know what to do if um, we have an emergency situation like that. All right. Last question: Do you have a any sort of a daily routine that keeps you sharp, that keeps you on on mission, if you will, just like for flying? Well, for flying, also sort of post flying, you know, in your daily right. life now. I do. Um, you know, my daily life is, I almost want to say more hectic than my military life because, you know, I'm training people, I'm speaking to people, I'm doing podcasts, um, got two kids who do jujitsu, swimming, piano, like I keep them busy. So um, one thing I do, even during COVID, I try to work out daily in some capacity. I may or may not hit that. Um, I try to get some time to myself, even if it's for a half an hour, usually it's, it's in my workout. And then I, I keep a pretty good daily planner. I actually write all my stuff. I hand write my stuff down. So I try to keep focused on that. When COVID hit and everything was shut down and the kids were doing homeschool, uh, what I would do is I, I would do um, a three, two, one workout. I'd keep the same routine. The kids would get up the same time as they would for school. They get dressed. No one stayed in their pajamas. I would go work out and do, you know, three minutes of cardio, two minutes of strength and one minute of abs. So I always called them my three, two, one to get the mm -hmm. blood pumping. We'd have breakfast and then we'd get to work. My husband would work in his office and we would swap out teaching the kids. And uh, we kept that routine. Um, as a military person, you know when you're in a situation where everything is, um, I don't wanna say you feel trapped, but that's what COVID did. It trapped us in our homes sure. and with each other. You have to establish a routine to, it helps with your mental health. It helps with your physical health, um, especially kids that can be really annoying and uh, you get them outside. Um, thank goodness we live in an area where uh, the kids could still bike and do things. And uh, we just, we stayed off, we stayed off the television in regards to news. So you didn't get bogged down with that because that could be incredibly depressing, especially when people are feeding you a lot of stuff from different media outlets. Um, and we just focused on what we had to do. So um, yeah, that's my routine. And it hasn't changed that much now because it's just busy. And if I didn't, if I didn't have an outlet or routine, ah, man, it would be easy for me to get bogged down and get depressed and all that. Merrill, I'm so grateful you took the time out to talk to us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Appreciate is there any, it. Is there anything else you want to add that out of all the stuff that we talked about? No, I, you know, for the people, the audience out there that's listening, you know, there's, I think we're living in a, in a great time. I know there's a lot of things happening politically, Ukraine, Russia, China, all these things, but America is still a place where like you could do almost anything you want to do and and the fact that we're here living, talking about it, the fact that you're on YouTube means that you're in a position to take advantage of the life and the place that you live. And it's, incumb it's incumbent upon you to utilize that. Don't waste it. Just don't. I mean, it's easy. Right now, it's easy to sit back and, and say, oh, I don't feel great about myself. And I'm just going to wait for tomorrow. Don't wait for tomorrow. Get up right now, go to the gym, go do some push-ups. go take a walk, start thinking about where you wanna put yourself in the next five years and start writing down a plan to go do that. That's, that's my recommendation. And my Thank categories, he just, just meowed at me. Thank you again. Thank you.